friends, 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 bum, 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 friends, it's on the friends, friends. Actually, last week we talked about the electronic, the um, the Energizer Bunny, and I was going to get a giant drum and hit it like the Energizer Bunny and do friends, 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 and I I, I dropped the ball. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, alas. Um, I'd be curious what you've been thinking about recently, Mr. Jockin. I've been thinking about... One, I, I listened to a bit of a, that debate between like Destiny and Jordan Peterson, and I'm like between state involvement, intervention, coordination problem. Do we even need a state anymore? Or can we just use the internet to vote? Because does the state actually add value? What's the, the use of it? I've been thinking about that. I've also been thinking about it. We had a talk with Aspasia the other evening. Tyler, good to see you, sir. Um, on the idea that when we're trying to learn and get clarity about something, what exactly is it we're trying to get clarity of if our reality is distorted? What exactly are we trying to undistort when we're engaged in thinking? But those are just thoughts. I'm down for talking about anything. So, Tyler, Philip, good to see you. So, uh, what have you, what's been on your mind lately, Mr. Jockin? Well, it's funny because I was just talking to Javier. I was hoping he's going to be on this call today. Let's pressure uh, him. I'm sure we could pressure him somehow. I know. Go bully him. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we were we were discussing. He wanted he wanted some meditations about. Uh, he's working through some not problems with the concept of flack, but he's working with Andrew Luber. And I assume mm. I assume he's going to drop in later today. Uh, they were they were having conversation. I was having a conversation with them about what what we talked about, right? Partial objects as a way to discuss lack mm. in a way that might be a little more enlightening to uh, people's understanding. It might uh, catch up, might trip up as many biases or misunderstandings possibly. Um, and then because it, it's, I think it just kind of summarized the point, um, reason why I brought up with Javier was I originally talked to him because I'm on, I'm in a currently a Twitter war. I'm in a complete polemic battle with some, uh, Christian apologet, uh, apologist right now on Twitter. It's very fascinating. I was, and that's the reason originally why I talked to Javier was because I was like, my God, what a difference of qualitative experience going to the net. And then seeing what the internet does uh, in its normal operation, where it's fun because I got to use I got to use my uh, my sophistic reputations from Aristotle in full force. It was quite fun. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. And actually, I, I even told Javier, I was like, you know, generally, I think most people would probably defaultly blindly say, no, the kind of polemic uh, polarization of Twitter is not the way we're going to get this resolved or like work through thoughts. Uh, we're going to need spaces of dialogos or spaces of a little bit more opening. Um, you know, I have to say, maybe it's because I got on the better side of the, of the polemic in that exchange at this point. Um, I think there's something good in conflict. I think sure. polemics, when, uh, when it's co-equal uh, contestants who can come equipped with the, have the right equipment to like do good sparring with each other with a commitment to the truth. Uh, I think you can get very enlightening insights because um, the most important thing actually from the, the, the kind of summarize what the polemic is about. It's the most typical uh, challenge you'll normally hear from people who have a bias against Islam, which is the Aisha marriage uh, issue. So I walked through that with that individual and I basically summarized it got worked through. I was like, well, wait a minute. If the idea of divine command is the predication that the moral order can be suspended for, excuse me, the ethical order, excuse me, can be suspended for the moral order of what God commands. And that's truly good. And God never commands what's evil. He always does what's good. Um, then what is the justification for Abraham's binding of Isaac? What's your justification? And it got in through the, the kind of, real link is to demonstrate challenging that was occurring um it was revealed that what this individual's justification was no uh abraham had dread he knew what he was doing was wrong and that was the even with his faith and that was the reason why he was justified that see that's interesting because that is a really fascinating argument right there uh obviously muslims say no uh, on that point, but more importantly, even uh, pre-Kantian points of view of ethics, of virtue, would challenge that and say, if you're in contention of doing the good, if something's wrong with you. Like, the act of doing virtuous acts are for, for the man of virtue is supposed to be easy. 
it's not unthought almost. It's literally habituated. It's what you are. Uh, so that's a, I find that immensely entertaining and immensely, uh, not just entertaining, but enlightening as a, I don't think that would ever got revealed unless we had this really strong polemic challenge. Uh, and I'll just leave it with that because I'm just throwing it to the group. Which way, which way you guys want to take that point? I'll leave it at that. No, that's magnificent, Mr. Jock. And I appreciate it. Mr. Joel, it is a pleasure to see you, sir. Joel is a fantastic writer at The Natural Theologian. I had a wonderful talk with him. I suggest his work. And you also, Joel, just to today put out a fantastic piece on being against concepts. Oh, I love that title. That was great. You know, where why why settle with the uh the the uh the window curtain versus the window? Very interesting piece that you were going through on that. So Joel is oh, and Mr. Luber will join us today. Well, I think it's very interesting. I think like on the idea of conflict having got, you know, I definitely would not say that necessarily um, removing disagreement or any form on something like Twitter isn't bad. In fact, the disagreement can bring forth um, thought that otherwise um, would never emerge. And Mr. Luber, it is good to see, and I'll pass it to Philip in a moment. I think the issue is you have to genuinely go into the disagreement in the good faith of wanting to actually understand or learn the other side and to advance your own thinking. And also, I think most disagreement doesn't tend to work because people are not able to move between, say, seeing the way the other person uses words or sees the other way that the person is having that story. So they're basically trying to throw, I think we see this a lot on the liminal web now, where people try to like force one another into their language, like their meta language, their way of using terms. Well, that doesn't work. So there's an entire kind of art form to actually create the conditions where disagreement can bring forth insight. And unfortunately, often people don't meet those terms, but if they do meet those terms, it can actually be, be very, very fruitful. Um, I, th I think that definitely um, comes, to, comes to light. I, I would say myself, like in Cheetan, good to see you, sir. And then I'll give it to Philip. Like one of the things I guess I, I was speaking to Aspasia about this, or maybe Mr. Luba. Actually, it was Mr. Luba yesterday when we were talking. So it's good to see you, sir. Like I basically force myself to mostly read books I disagree with, not books I agree with, because that very tension forces a certain thinking. And then when I go talk to someone who say likes the worldview of that book I disagree with, maybe let's say something uh, like a John Rawls theory of justice or different things like that, but, you know, it forces me to see the good in it, but also it forces me to think through Rawlsianism in a way that makes me try to think um, in a better manner. And I also learn how to kind of swim in those waters. And that then therefore, when you come into the conversation with people that disagree with you, you don't spend like 45 minutes just arguing over the language or the terms or getting lost in kind of knee-jerk reactions. So I also find reading books I disagree with can be very helpful, but let me give it to Philip and Chitani. It's good to see you. And also the stuff on the partial object is a big deal. And Javier Rivera, good to see you as well. But Philip, please. You know, I think I may have to start calling you Daniel Tello. You know, I don't know if anyone's seen this guy's staff skills, but if you want to, if you want to pressure Oh yeah, uh, Javier, to get onto this, if you want to do a little Twitter war, you want to invite those boys to the playground. Damn, you know, but you know what I would do if I saw Danny like coming at me, staff spinning. I would like challenge him to a push-up contest. So there is something too, like no, 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 we got to stay in this mode at least for some time, in order to. Get to a place where authority doesn't dictate. That is to say, I, I know uh, Javier talks about Adam Phillips a lot. He wrote this uh, Unforbidden Pleasures um, book where he says, uh, it's like you need to know which arguments you need to not avoid in order to keep like life going in uh, either a milieu or... Um, a relationship. And I think a little, you know, what, what, what uh, Jockin was saying, like kind of like a celebrity death match, maybe instead of like an infotainment, there's like a enlightenment or something where two people come together and they're sort of like representatives. I think this would be interesting. There was that conversation with Daniel Tut and Haas the other day. That was, I, I, th I thought quite interesting where you get people from the left talking to MAGA communists and actually seriously engaging with one another um, as a way of uh, 
not invoking authority from the outside, like m making the thing current. Cause Danny, you were talking about like clarity and I'm listening to like what Jockin is saying. You're getting into the, these like various herme hermeneutical debates and like some of the things with clarity strikes me to, to go through like a, a process that you can at least outline something happens and I go, okay, uh, how does this fit into my common sense zeitgeist? And then I go, okay, it kind of, I, I can see it there. Then I do give it like an interiority test. But I think there's a really important part of the interiority test is that like you've done some effort and some work to see the constitution of that filter so that you're not just like, oh yeah, obviously it's like, this, that, and the other thing, and someone's like, well, dude, you're a Taylor Swift fan who buys Obey or whatever. Like, like you, you had it like, did you not know that? Um, and then I think you take it against your, like, ground, your first principles and values. Common sense, interiority, first pr principles and values. And then you look to respond. This is could probably shorthandly be called like contemplation reflection. Um, and I wonder if in, in both those instances and also with, with the staff fighting, if it, if that could be the clarity that people are looking for it, it is in this joint effort that looks like argumentation, but, and it probably is, but in a way it could be, um, avoiding the stagnation of unearned authority. I think that's fantastic. And I'll pass it to Mr. Luber. And I really like this kind of idea. First, I really like knowing the questions not to avoid, knowing the debates not to avoid. I think that's a really powerful thing because like, you know, you mentioned the, the type Hanzi conversation, which I listened to, Um, you know, like to me, what's so important, or even like recently, Jordan Peterson had a, a, a kind of a debate with Destiny that I listened to because Tim at Voicecraft were talking about that. To me, the question that emerges that needs to be really kind of focused on, I'll take the Peterson Destiny one first, is the question of, can you have government involved at all to stop externalities without falling into coordination problem? And that's what Peterson was kind of pointing at. And that's what Destiny was pointing at. Because Destiny said, well, we can see from the Soviet Union that no one overcomes the coordination problems. But that doesn't mean you can't have a Keynesian thing. And then Peterson comes in and he says, well, how do you not end up from Keynesianism having the same problems of the coordination problem, right? And they went back and forth. And then they got into fights on research and different things. I think that question is very important. But to add to what I would add to that to be then really the massive, for me, what becomes massive for belonging again, is if Carl Planier and many economists are correct that there has never been a free market though, that means it's always been a mixed market. Well, that means every instance of the market in history have actually been mixed and have somehow, if, if Peterson is correct, that there's no way to avoid the coordination problem if the state is involved, well, somehow it's been avoiding it at least on massive enough of a scale, or maybe it never does. And that's why you have the business cycle keeps going on, right? So what if all of those things are true? Well, then that's what we need to debate. You see what I'm saying? Like that to me is what's being avoided. That would be much more productive to just run in and talk about that. Now, the second, the Hansi and Tut, you know, what Hans kept saying is like, when I go to Russia, it feels like a, there's a culture, right? Like there's people on the streets, there's like an identity, there's sort of nationality and different things like that. And when I come to America, it doesn't feel like there's any culture at all. Right. Like that's where he's kind of stressing. Now, of course, like when we look back in history, like what we talk about in belonging again. Yeah. The conditions of givens, lack of pluralism, lots of similarities, they tend to create a feeling of a shared culture. But that comes at the risk of cutting, cutting out difference, banality of evil and all of those other things. So how do you get a c common life that has a communal identity without falling into the banality of evil? Bam. That's a problem we want to focus on, you see? And like being able to me to identify what are the questions that are not being addressed would one save a lot of problems, but be very valuable. And to the coordination problem, that's from Von Mises. That, that's a great question. The complexity that it would take in order to coordinate the distribution of resources in a society of millions of people in the most effective way without a lot of waste, without causing mass starvation, without having a uh, state that's really powerful that then can manipulate everyone to get your goods is impossible. And so for von Mises, it's very similar to the knowledge problem in Friedrich Hayek, which means you have to have an emergent 
pricing mechanism for the coordination because that's the only that's the only way you get enough computing power to solve this problem. So that's what they mean by the coordination problem. It's in, you know von Mises kind of bases his whole theory on it, and then that's where someone like China is coming along and saying, "Oh, we can deal with that. We're just going to use AI, mass surveillance, the sensocracy of maybe an Alexander Bard." That might work, but then you have to ask if that's what you want, right? But that is that is kind of the question. And another way to frame it, and then I'll pass it to Luber and Mr. Jockin, um, although a lot of what you were saying on the debate stuff is important. Um, basically, the question is, can you have a socioeconomic system that addresses the coordination problem but doesn't sacrifice communal life in the same act? Because that seems to be so far in the 20th century what we haven't figured out. Like the more you get able to deal with the coordination problem, especially at a global scale, that results in a loss of the communal identity or the ability to, for people to be particularly grounded so they don't end up in the alienation that Hans was talking about with Tut, right? So those to me are kind of the, the problems. And then if those are the problems of which almost by definition, because of their multivalence and severity, there's going to be a disagreement about... The question is, how does that disagreement become most um, productive? I think that's what you're pointing at too, Philip. I would definitely say that it is hard to have productive disagreement with someone of whom you don't feel some sort of investment in. Like, I'm going to live with you. Like, if you disagree with someone, think about always relating to them as a friend or as a person so that you have skin in the game, that you're going to share in their common life. I find that increases the probability of constructive disagreement. And also, too, understanding that when you get to these high-level problems, basically no, what was uh, Destiny calling it, constellation of political alignment or visions, as Thomas Sowell would say, or package, none of them have the, the address at this moment, right? Well, if we get that, then we're not armies trying to kill one another. We're trying to solve something. And then the authority of the conversation seems like it has to emerge within the consistency of it. So then it's very important not to appeal to things outside the conversation that the person would have to be familiar with to understand your point. You see people do that all the time. This study said, well, this book said, well, that I don't have that and I don't know if you're interpreting it. So the conversation kind of gets destroyed, right? So there's different tactics and methodologies that have to be employed as well. But let me stop there and pass it to Mr. Luber Jockin and then Javier. Mr. Luber, how are you doing on this day? How's Heidi? How's your puppy? How's your puppy, Luber? He's good. Oh, He's right here. there's Heidi. <laughs> Look at Heidi. He's having a little bone. Um, uh, this is this is as usual. Good, really good stuff. Um, I'm just trying to get my thoughts in order. Um, I think I also watched not all of it, but part of it. The Peterson Destiny thing, just just because Shandleman is like a big fan of Destiny, and I'm like. I don't know who that is, so I like kind of look into him, and like to me, at least this is what I see, and I think this is like there's there's a problem inherently with what I'm about to say, which is it's like going against the culture, it's going against the 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 pattern that our current um, society sort of operates under. So there's probably something not totally true about what I'm saying, but I think. Um, I think the question, like, what is special? And I've been thinking about this for a few days. Um, what is special definitely relates here because I think a lot of people are abandoning being truly open for the sake of feeling like their perspective is special. There's something that they, the, the perspective they want to hold on to, in a sense, clouds their ability to basically prop up what someone else says other than what they say. And like that's a, that's a big big problem. That I think a possible problem with what I'm saying though is like, and if that if you were to take my logic to its end, it would be there's no such thing as a famous person, or like you know an Einstein. Like nobody would revere somebody in that way. There would be no idol, which is a problem in itself. I think that there is a need for like an idol, um, but I, I do think that we get into these short circuits because people just think that their perspective is special they want to hold on to the feeling of special whatever that means um and i think i would love to hear what people think about what is just what the concept of special is um and it's 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 just making me think that 
if people were actually open to the truth, they would say their perspective, then they would hear another perspective, digest it, think about the circuit in a certain sense of which it's situated in. And then in that sense, through through thinking about what the other perspective is, can realize the circuit and therefore go and move on to a different um, unfolding, talk about a different unfolding. And I think it takes a lot of humility to even do that because you have to prop up what the other says in a way where you realize the circuit in which you yourself are also operating under. And in that sense, it frees yourself from the circuit. And then you can then think about possible other uh, circuits, if you will. You're just going to jump into, in my mind, a different circuit. But um, like the Peterson destiny, it just felt like you could just feel the circuit so much. Like it's just, it's just too, it's just so, um, you can feel the dichotomy. Like th that's the thing in today. I feel in most conversations, you could feel the dichotomy where in a true conversation. And what I mean by that is just like a conversation where you're really open, you're really open into just like thinking about the truth. In that sense, you can't really tell the dichotomy because it moves quickly. It's like you, you can get lost in the sauce if you think in terms of dichotomy because it just moves from dichotomy to dichotomy very quickly. Um, but yeah, I'll just start with that. But there, yeah, that was really good stuff. No, that's outstanding. I'll give it to Mr. Jock and Javier. And I love that question. Once. But yeah, you could definitely be special by being alone. You know, get yourself on like a space station. You're the only one there. You will definitely be special because you're the only human being. So there definitely is something about being special and cutting off. I mean, it, it reminds me how many artists like don't want to read books because they don't want to be influenced. And like originality has an isolating principle as well. Or they don't read other philosophers because, ah, what if they lose their ideas? And there's something interesting about the human being creating spe a feeling of specialness from an isolationism, which seems very dangerous. But then, of course, when you open to the other, then that can be un you know existentially anxious or make you question everything and you no longer feel like you even have an identity because who am I? What is even the human being? And ah, so you go from an isolated feeling of value to an open kind of void. And the question is, how do you negate, sublate that to actually something more like harmony as we've talked about in the past? And so I think also, well, it makes me think, I think, I think it um, it makes me think of Mr. Uh, Ebert's work, who we talked with, and then I'll pass it to Jockin and then Javier. It seems like the feeling of specialness needs to be found not in a kind of identification, but in a capacity to handle encountering limit, otherness, surprise. That the specialness is the encounter with the unknown that you are then able to meet in a manner that is special in the sense that most people, when they do that, have a nervous breakdown. But when you do that, you're actually able to see it for an opportunity of growth, maybe. Maybe special, if that word has meaning as what the average doesn't do, maybe then it is the ability to encounter disagreement or a different view and not fall in the constellation or fall into the rigidity that you were describing, but to actually hit it and have it call back on you to think to a higher level. So instead of you being special, which could ruin, could risk a certain egotism, maybe it's special in the correct response to the encounter of limitation, of hitting something. And I think to that then, I mean, it just makes me think of on this point of disagreement, kind of tying to story, I think most conversations are disagreeable and they fall into those kind of rigid structures versus being like a story that unfolds with people who are different, like different characters on the Lord of the Rings to reference your work, who then encounter an obstacle that, such as, oh, it looks like that the capitalism tends towards stagnation following a Tyler Cohn or Keynes, but then it also looks like if a government tries to stimulate demand, all they can do is stimulate demand, not create demand, which means we have no adequate economic theory right now to deal with the realities of modern capitalism. Let's go on an adventure today to Mount Doom to see if we can deal with that. That kind of journeying and conversation where the obstacle arises in the conversation, where we then go on a journey together with our different expertise and skills and abilities to try to think it through, that seems to be different than the structure of disagreement that is often the army's fighting, per se. I'd have to go into detail on that, but it makes me think of conversation as an unfolding story 
versus conversation as making sure that the people who follow my YouTube channel uh, hear the stuff they want to hear so they're not mad at me. You know, audience capture are different things. But let me pass it to Thomas Jockin, Javier, and then Tyler Murphy. Mr. Jockin. Great conversation as always, everybody. Um, I remember when I first started studying logic, a lecture I watched, he basically made this statement. He presented an argument where two people are having a disagreement with each other. Generally, a lot of times in those arguments is a presupposition that maybe person A is telling the truth, is telling the right account. Maybe person B is telling the right account. So one is with the presumption that if one is true, the other must be false. But wait a minute. And a logic and a truth table is just as it, it could be just as likely that both could be telling the truth, have true claims, or also they have false claims. They're both false. Uh, they're both not true, uh, whatever this being claimed. Um, I always usually, I think that that right there, I think summarizes what I'm hearing about this orientation about contention, debate, or communication. Uh, there is a presumption of specialness, what Lou was saying, of like, no, no, my point, my access to reality is obviously correct. And obviously my interpretation is the truth, obviously. Uh, and if you disagree with that, that means you're clearly false, obviously. Uh, and never... It does take a certain kind of willingness to have an orientation to go, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> but more importantly, actually, but not even just like a supplicating, like I'm just going to concede to the other party immediately. No, no. What if they're wrong too? What if we're both wrong? What if there's some fundamental principle? So what uh, Philip, I believe, said earlier, right, where you need to get to a first principle. There's probably some first principle that you're both got wrong. It's a po there's a possibility. And if you have to hunt that down, and my opening statement, my kind of opening solo point about this uh, from my Twitter conversation was a first principle was revealed. It was dug out. And we found out that's it's just a fascinating point. Like, oh, that's what we actually have contention about. That is actually what the issue is. It did require, and I actually remember in the exchange, I said at one point, um, maybe we're both wrong. We'll find out the truth in the last judgment because we're both you know, but many people of faith, so we have that. Can we both agree to that point? So we'll know the truth. We'll know it in the last judgment. We're not there yet, now, are we? So we might be both wrong. Even I'm arguing, even as I'm debating with you, I'm still even. I'm willing to have orientation to say I might be absolutely. I might be false. Who knows? Uh, so I think that's that's almost the like. If you actually notice the tenor difference, that's like the ten, if I had to kind of put my thing my my finger on the tenor qualitative difference of a. Uh, dialectic polemic that has the right orientation it seems almost like the members have to not just concede to like coming to a first principle that they both can agree to but more importantly that they could orient themselves either to be we might be both telling the truth but we have different aspects of the phenomenon or the reality uh or we're both wrong because we're misunderstanding some first principle so i think that's actually a really Nice qualification. I was kind of thinking through that, connecting to that lecture I had, I listened to. Right, and at the very beginning, I studied, le I studied logic. Um, the other note, uh, what Luber was saying about the nature of exemplars. You know, that's actually really interesting too, because it's funny. Because the next Einstein will not be Einstein. It will not be mimetic copying. It can't be that. Um, I'll, I'll use another example. I mean, I remember boxing. You know, when you actually listen to like interviews with Tyson, especially when it was coming up. Uh, he used to study very old school boxing film, all right? And it's like John Johnson, like the first heavyweight of uh, in history, for example, in the modern, in the 1800 period. Uh, he's studying them, but yet he boxed nothing like them. He was taking them as exemplars. They were basically, they embodied as almost, Daniel, I'm going to borrow, uh, partial objects of a principle. Hit and don't be hit. And the particulars of how that gets expressed is individuated. Tyson could not copy John Johnson or any other exemplars he studied. It's impossible. He could not do it. Uh, he had to become something different. He became a definite, he became an exemplar by a different expression of that same exemplar principle. He became a partial object in that orientation too. Never the full expression of it. Can't, it's an inexhaustible. That's the whole point. And any kind of mimetic copying of a kind of possessive copying of a mimetic cop of a knowing by that mode, uh, it's actually dead. It doesn't work because you'll just be replicating Tyson. You're not an actual boxer. Just like Floyd could not box like Mike Tyson. It's the same point. He had to study other exemplars and he came to a different solution, a different addressing or answer to the call. Um, 
So that's just like the other part of it too, right? Is that also a lot of times we have to remember most argue debates, they're mimetic processes to just beat down the other side to, re to replicate and expand or like distribute a mimetic virus of, of a certain account. That's what it's trying to do. So that's, a, that's like the other part of it. So it's not, so that point is like, I have the truth. You clearly do not. I'm not even willing to entertain the possibility that I, I might be wrong or you might be like, actually correct as well from a different perspective, but also our engagement is it's purpose to be of a medic virus distribution. That is uh, distribution of a medic, of a medic information. So I think that's really fascinating. I'll close with that. No, that's magnificent. I'll pass it to Javier and then Tyler. Yeah, it's very interesting because in my experience, like we were saying, there are many artists or thinkers who are like, I don't want to read past philosophers because I don't want to be like them. And it's almost like actually the exact opposite. Like when you're afraid of the tradition, then you end up like being a copy of something uh, without even realizing it. Whereas when you revisit it, that's where the creative act occurs. Now, I don't want to push that too hard, but it's, you know, it's a phrase Michelle and I will say is what you fear is what comes unto you. And if you're like afraid of not being special, so you isolate yourself. That's precisely not special because there's something about human nature that tends to avoid otherness and difference and stuff, right? And, get, and cave into fear, right? So it's very interesting how actually, um, I mean, you'll see this in, in the, some of the greatest thinkers or inventors or athletes, they're studying the tradition quite heavily. Uh, and you don't see that resulting in them just mimetic. It results in them actually being creative. Now, not every philosopher is reading the whole tradition. I know Wittgenstein was not too big on it. But I think a part of his genius, though, came from being very diverse. He's like an architecture. He's designing houses, mathematics. He's teaching. So you got to get your diversity from somewhere. And that can come from studying the tradition, all the different books, or maybe having different occupations. Although I, I do... So um, I think that's very interesting that the fear of not being original can act by, by studying the past actually can result in what you fear coming unto you. The last thing I'll say that I think was really good is that in my experience, like I, I like a lot of times when people come into a debate, it's like, I'm either right or they're right. Well, that doesn't follow. You could both be wrong or you actually could both be right in ways you don't realize, assuming the premises do not necessarily contradict or only logically contradict in the detail, but not the substance, right? That's one of the reasons why I personally, like, um, because I guess for me, the productive disagreement that is, that is being discussed, I find in the act of intentionally creating contradiction that I have to confront. So for example, uh, one of the big things in Belonging Again too is Dietrich McClowski hates Carl Planier. Doesn't hate. She really does not like Carl Planier, who wrote The Great Transformation. Well, I really like Dietrich McClowski. So now I'm going to, you know, so then you read all of Carl, Carl Planier and say, what if they're both right? Well, this creates a contradiction because it can't be the case they're both right. But what if you force yourself to try to think that? That creates, for me, the most creative energy that generates ideas versus trying to defend McClowski against uh, Planier or defend Planier against McClowski. Or you could say they're both wrong, but that just means you don't read either of them, right? I find personally, this is just a heuristic. I'm not saying this is a law of all creativity. I find that when I read a book, find out everyone they disagree with, then go read those people and then assume they're both right. That tends to be what generates a lot of um, creative thinking uh, or new insight. And I find that tension, which is kind of disagreement, but for me, it's a disagreement created out of contradiction almost, that then is like more generative. Now, I'd have to go into detail of that, but what you were saying reminded me of that. And I actually think like not doing that results in the political discourse generally being weak. Like it, it gets, it falls into presuppositions or boxes or kind of already well uh, trotted paths that are not very interesting or maybe not as productive as they could be. So I really like what you said, but let me give it to Javier, Tyler Murphy, Philip, and then Mr. Luber. Mr. Javier Rivera, how are you today, sir? Hey, um, yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm happy we're going into this conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's like a, it's a hard thing, right? I, I mean, I think this is basically what we're getting at. We're like Luber bringing up specialness, um, Thomas Jockin bringing up the notion of the exemplar and the sort of the unforeseeable variability <laughs> or the limitlessness of the expression <laughs> 
Um, I think when it comes to disagreement, the presumption is we know what the antithesis is, right? We 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 know what the antithesis is to the conversation we have already decided to talk about. Um, but I think perfect case example, Thomas Jockin Exchange on Twitter revealed that whatever was on the appearance of the disagreement, it started becoming a, a different form of a dis disagreement, um, mainly because what started happening was, and I think most people would read the exchange as, oh, now they're going on like more tangential lines of thought, but that actually isn't true. What's happening in real time is the fact that the antithesis that was at the beginning was no longer the antithesis that was thought of. It it was actually something else. Um, so now it now we're getting at through conversation a more concrete, at least in the moment, a more concrete idea of like what is it that we're disagreeing about. And I think usually that's the hardest problem with disagreement. And like this is funny because like we do this all the time, right? We'll be like, I disagree. But the moment, right? But it's funny because it's a really paradoxical thing because it's like you also need to have that I disagree moment to then figure out what is it that you're actually disagreeing about because the other person could respond and be like, I don't think you understood me. Um, this is what I'm talking about and so on and so on. And then you'll be like, okay, okay. And it could still be a disagreement. It's just now it's like, okay, I see where you're coming from now. Um, so so this is really interesting um, how arguments, even though they they seem, they have to, I think, they have to kind of start with a kind of antithesis to uh, make the person engage. I think the problem now is, is how do you maintain this engagement and and basically keep talking like to me like to me this is how i look at it this is maybe spicy i don't know the way i look at it is a good claim is whatever keeps people talking to me that's a good claim people be like it can be still a quote bad claim but if it's a bad claim that gets people talking to me that's good enough um versus Claims that shut down the conversation, because that's fundamentally what you guys are talking about. Claims that shut down the conversation, which is, for the most part, not what people want. I mean, it's what we want, but it's also simultaneously not not what we want, depending on which side we're in, right? Do we feel like we got the advantage in the conversation? Do we feel like we don't have the advantage of the conversation? Um, so there's a lot there with that. But I, I think usually it is this task of, of noticing the false dichotomies that are asserted when somebody is speaking. Um, and that's really hard. That's really hard to say. Like, you know, usually I say something like, and this was actually posed against me one time, <laughs> was uh, something like, Javier, why are you thinking only between um, letting go and repression? Because basically I, I framed this question. I said, I cannot tell the difference um, between repression and letting go. Those, those movements almost seem like the same. Um, and then what was thrown back to me as a question was, why are those the only two frameworks that you are concerned about, basically? And even though I didn't have an answer to it, it revealed something in the, of the nature of the conversation, meaning that I was confining my story to either repression or letting go bye jock in i'm sorry you gotta go <laughs> uh but good conversation um but yeah so I'll, I'll be curious about this and the last question i have is for you daniel can you I, I think you said it but i think i missed it what is the coordination problem exactly no it's outstanding i love what you said there i'm a mr jock in and i hope you have a good haircut and clayton it is good to see you sir clayton's podcast is amazing everyone i've really enjoyed his conversations at lib quality very well done my friend other
to what you were saying, and then I'll give it to Tyler Phillip and then Mr. Luber. I um I really like the idea of not even knowing the antithesis of the conversation. I think that's extremely good. And I like the idea as well, because I think about this a lot on your if your if you say something that keeps the conversation from going, that could be problematic, which makes me think of Mr. Luber's work on story, because you should always talk in a manner where you encounter the limits of what you know, the limits of what they know, the obstacle of which then glimpses the theme of the conversations that's trying to come into focus, of which necessarily results in a continual unfolding of the conversation, right? Because there's a weird thing where if I'm able to say something that ends the conversation, then why did we even have the conversation if we knew the answer? We should have just kind of gone to the answer before we even started talking, right? So like you should be picking topics to discuss that ha that bring out some sort of limitation to what we know or that it doesn't seem like is widely known. That's why we're talking about it because we don't know the answer. And so there's something we're trying to glimpse. Like, for example, because I'm um, incredibly dismal in my economic thinking, I think uh, like Keynes has a really good point that um, capitalism seems to destroy demand. Eventually demand goes away because it can only stimulate demand versus create demand. Keynes' solution to this that the government stimulates demand I take the horrific view to agree that capitalism destroys de demand and the government can't do anything about it. That's miserable, Daniel. You're supposed to say that the government can stimulate de demand, not that there's a demand problem in capitalism and then the state can't do anything about it. Well, that because what does that do? To me, that's actually probably the most likely position and it creates a limit on what the state can do, which means we have to talk about what exactly would be the proper discussion to it, which we don't seem to know the answer ahead of time. Therefore, we need to discuss that and have that unfold live, right? Likewise, if McClowski and Fonnier are both correct, well, that creates a tension that then has to unfold, right? And I think, honestly, it just speaks to Mr. Ebert's work, is that, funny enough, conversations don't come to an end in this problematic way when they encounter limit. That limit is creative. Like you would think it'd be the exact opposite, that encountering the limit would end the conversation because we don't know the answers. No, no, no. Encountering the limits of the preset political platforms we have or the preset limits of economic thinking we have is the birth of creative thought, actually. So there's a funny way in which conversation that encounters limit becomes generative, whereas conversation that denies limit ends. So it's very counterintuitive, and it makes me think of Mr. Ebert's work. But let me pass it to Tyler, Philip, and then Mr. Luber. Tyler, please. Yeah, this is great. I um, some of the questions that have that I've written down here are things like. Um, have we even really had a true conversation or a real conversation um, if grace isn't present? Um, and because otherwise, is it just that we are, is it without grace, is it just two egos just talking right past each other? And um, and then what are the conditions necessary for grace to be infused within a, within a conversation? Um, those are some of the, and, and then I guess also does the very form of say Twitter um, foreclose that possibility of grace even being there in the first place, as opposed to something like this, where um, just even in the way that you, Daniel, come in and invite people in and welcome everybody to the, so much to the, to the so that I feel as though, you know, I'm just this dumb artist from Montana, but I can, I can at least like jump in and, you know, try my hand at just speak my mind and, and, and see if anything lands. Um, and that, you know, Michelle uh, sent me this um, really beautiful conversation between Cadell Last and Mark Gerard Murphy, great last name. Um, and he was talking about, you know, he, he's putting uh, Lacan in dialogue with John of the Cross and talking about Holy Spirit as these moments, these moments of encounter with Holy Spirit as, as um, these moments when our tongues have been freed in some way, where we can just speak freely. And his experience of how he found that in um, going to Lacanian analysis and uh, 
so anyways uh those that's some of the stuff that's been on my mind and just wanted to throw that in so those are excellent questions i appreciate everything you said Tyler. i think that's a very good question on grace um i definitely think uh, it, well, it's interesting. Um, we have a paper called On Critical Thinking, where basically we argue that critical thinking is empathy, not in like the sentimental kind of sense, but empathy as in your ability to enter into another structure of understanding reality and look back on your own. Like without that kind of movement, you, you know, critical thinking is the act of um, kind of like a movie critic is a critic of not just if they like or dislike the movie, but the very structure of the movie and how it unfolds and all those different things. Like, I think critical thinking is something like that, where you actually kind of step out of your way of seeing and, like, critique the way that your thinking makes the world unfold relative to you. Which, one, you need grace in the sense of you need to have grace on yourself when you do that to realize, I'm full of self-deception, I have no idea what I'm talking about, and I tend to see evidence that's not there. So you need grace in that sense, of critical thinking, but you also need grace in the sense of like, you see these conversations where the moment somebody uses a term that they don't like, they jump on it. Like, I don't, you can't say that. Or the moment they reference Marx, Marx, he killed millions of people. Like, oh, Christian, you know what they did in the Catholic Church? Bam, bam, bam. There's no grace, right? Well, the funny thing is, that means you never actually encounter limitation to be generative because you actually stop your view encountering the limits of your view where it hits the other person and now empathy is possible. I think also, um, so I do think grace is needed. And then actually it makes me think of Flannery O'Connor's sense of grace, which means grace is always painful. It You absolutely, to have a good conversation, have to suffer some pain in the sense of having your worldview question being open to difference. Like the, you know, grace Grace requires nails, right? You know, grace requires dying to self in this sense. And if indeed a good conversation requires some sort of grace in the sense of love and respect for the other, it requires that. But then it also requires the Flannery O'Connor sense of the difficulty of hearing things you disagree with or different views, the violence that that does to you and, and not letting it um, lead to a pathological response. So I think it actually kind of brings in the Flannery O'Connor a bit, but let me give it to Philip and then Mr. Friends, Luba. Friends, 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 but I'm gonna dump friends, 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 and the things I'm gonna be, be, be. Okay, you there, Philip? Yep. I love that song. <laughs> yes. It's my favorite. I, uh, all right, this is like all giving me very, very like visual ideas of which stage of your thought the ideas are in like i'm thinking so much you know how like philosophers will talk about having a thought or inventing a word is like having a baby like i think it takes a different type of consideration if you're engaged with someone and you're both like in the placenta phase and it's like yeah we're just looking to try to like give this idea some nutrition versus being like, this is like a Methuselah idea. Like this idea has been birthed and it's been grown. And uh, it, it sort of reminds me of what, what uh, Javier was talking about when he was like, if you can keep that conversation going, it's good. Cause like in a way it either allows the, uh infant or adolescent to grow or be like hey it's it's time to it's time to move on and become fertilizer for the next generation of thoughts and all this stuff so like how can you maybe help the people you're uh with as far as like your grip goes on the conversation you're having uh and then kind of organize it for yourself based on how much attention you've paid to all these different thoughts. No, I, I love that, Phil. I'll give it to Luba and then Joel. Um, I, I, I definitely think there's something about stages of development, like growth. Well, I think also to get to the place where you can actually participate in the grace that Tyler was getting at, that requires like an emotional development over like 30 years, right? Like you don't just, we can all say we need to be nice when we hear things we disagree with, but that takes actually like work and training and time because like you can't help but have that like when you're young, just the look in your eyes 
or, you know, that change of uh, tone, these things are very natural. So there's also a kind of processing almost like a, a kind of a tactile knowledge that has to be gained in that to come to the place where you can do that. And I was also thinking like, yeah, there's a way in which one could hear the idea of keeping the idea going. And that sounds kind of relativistic. And we don't want to say anything is true and false. And we're just kind of being mushy. Well, I've actually found that when you go deep into an idea, like they're so full and connect with so much that you that it's not an issue of not taking a position is that when you take a position, it actually keeps blowing up like it keeps going. Right. Like if you go, OK, like when you go into economics, then you find yourself in politics, you find yourself in technology, you find yourself in metaphysics, like things lead on. If you keep it's funny because when you keep searching for the limit that then again, I'm just referencing Mr. Ebert because it's such a it's such a useful schema. That keeps it going, but not in a kind of relativistic lame way. It's like a story keeps going because it keeps glimpsing the theme. But that's only possible by moving to the limitation of your own views or the willingness to lay down your life, per se, to take up your cross. And that requires a certain vulnerability that's not easy. But then that's how I think you can find the middle ground middle ground or the ground um, by which you can keep a conversation going, but it not be like a lame relativism, because I think that's always the danger uh, in a way. But let me give it to Luber and then Joel. Mr. Luber. You're making me think that, and I guess this is really just a claim that I just need your, need your claim here. Um, when we see a short circuit, like I'm just giving it, I'm just labeling this a short circuit, but Destiny Peterson, they're clearly in a, like a circuit. If we just assume that's the case for the sake of argument here, um, they almost are like components of the story. They're like components of the operation, but they're not part of the nucleus of the operation. And because they're not like within the nucleus of the operation, they almost are like, they project, not project, but they like extend almost like a meaninglessness because they are perceived as like famous. Um, people like model their thinking, their lives, whatever around people like these type of people. So it's like you're modeling people that are actually like exterior components of the story. And I'm, I'm claiming they're exterior components of the story because they are just a short circuit. Like, when you're in a story, in my mind, wherever you look, you just see a short circuit. It's the main character, if you will, rubbing up against a bunch of short circuits because the main character in itself is is he who changes in a certain sense. So in that sense, he isn't actually ever getting caught in a short circuit. He kind of bounces from one to the other. So in that sense, it's like I'm watching their their like big debate thing. And it makes me sad in a way. And it's like, why, why am I feeling sad? And, and I don't know, I, I guess that's just like a hypothesis where it's just like, they're not actually living in a certain sense where they're part of the main nucleus of the operation of the story. Um, so I, and, and I think uh, a lot of what we're talking about has to do with like the partial object. I mean, Ebert's work, is great for that because it's like you kind of oscillate in and out of uh, seeing the partial object object in a certain sense because um, things become dynamic and static and they kind of they kind of move they kind of move in waves and then disperse and then it starts all over again. It's 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 like a reciprocal thing. It's not like you're just like necessarily permanently. Um, static or permanently dynamic, there's always the potential of shifting. Um, and I just think seeing, being, realizing the short circuit in a way where you get inhabited by another short circuit in a way that allows you to get inhabited by another and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's that partial object then, if you're seeing it in terms of like, thematically or you're you're caught in it for a time and then you're caught in another and it just kind of keeps on going it's like there's always a conversation to be had because 
it's almost endless the amount of short circuits you could kind of bounce in and out of. And it's like, then you can ask the question, like, what are the point? What's the point of seeing like the partial object continually? What's the point of bouncing from different short circuits? In other words, um, it's like, the point is, is that that is, okay, thank you. <laughs> My roommate just let him back in the house. I was, I was like looking for him for a second. He was distracting me. I'm like, where'd you go? You little bugger. Um, but, um, <laughs> uh, damn, I, I kind of lost what I was thinking, but I, I guess I'll just, I'll just finish it off with that. When you get to, when you look at the partial object in a nonlinear way and you see how, and, and you question how does the partial object keep revealing itself? The answer becomes, it's because you're going from short, different short circuits. And that means in that sense, you're living, you're living a story in the sense that you're seeing contradiction and you're moving in and out of different contradictions. And like the different contradictions that are placed in front of you that appear to you is what keeps you going. It's actually the mechanism that makes you move. So like in my mind, like that's the purpose of it. And it seems like the question of like, what is that at the end of the day? That's when you can kind of get in, like, it's very easy to be nihilistic about that. But I think when you think about it in terms of the ability to just move, it, 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 it's a different paradigm. It's a different perspective, but I, I, uh, yeah, I think that's a tangent, but anyway, I'll pass it off to. No, it Whatever. makes me think, like, so, for example, there's, like, when I watch Jordan Peterson and, like, the Wrestling with God or the early lectures, you see this individual that's, like, caught up in something that's changing his life and he's encountering his own limits. It's actually extremely interesting. It would require almost like a McLuhan or a William Ong, like, comparison of the difference between that structure of presentation versus the debate structure on the Daily Wire. Because, like, you see, like, in, when Peterson is at Harvard, that it's very clear, like, I I find that very engaging because it's very clear that his own he I feel like he feels like his own life has to be changed by way of where he arrives at so it's a real story like there are real stakes whereas honestly like sometimes at the Daily Wire some of those people feel like it's not part of that it's the it's more of okay it's you know it's that we got to do three of these a week we've got to have different guests and it becomes a business now I'm not saying that means it's necessarily bad I'm not saying that there are no good ideas, but it is very interesting that difference that you see. And it makes me think like Nassim Tlaib talked about like all philosophy has to be walking. You know, you got to walk to do philosophy. It kind of makes me think of that a little bit. And it is interesting because it's almost, and then I'll give it to Joel and then Cheetah and Philip is skiing again. Look at this guy. It makes me think as well, we talked about the partial object. And Mr. Jock, and wherever you are right now getting the haircut, I hope you feel the aura shift as I mentioned this. So for Aaron, the partial object is, is the definite object. You know, a definition is woman. The, defin the definition is woman. The definitive object is Michelle. And Michelle is actually the partial object, which sounds like it'd be less real, but it's actually more real because you only ever know them partially until the fullness of time. You have to relate to them all your life. The partiality is an invitation to know more and more and more and more. It's beauty. Beauty is partial, not because it's not there, but because it's so much there in excess, to use Mr. Ebert's language, that it exceeds your scope and is partial as an effect, but isn't, isn't incomplete in of itself, only in relation to you because you have to want to relate to it. You have to want to approach it, and that kind of moves you in. You encounter your limits, when you run into Beatrice like Dante, you encounter your limit when you encounter beauty, but that encounter with the limit is the invitation to go deeper into beauty, actually, right? And that's a kind of walking structure. Like, you see that, I think, when Peterson is wrestling with God. There's this glimpse of something bigger than him that is calling something upon his life that he's walking around trying to figure out what it means, like Dante ascending toward Beatrice. And actually, what's funny is I would say that the best conversations are basically partial object in form. Like, you don't know ahead of time the conclusion, but you know there's there. It's unfolding as it goes, like, like Javier was saying. So it's almost like in the same way that the, that the, the, the fullest reality 
is a definitive object, which is a partial object, because it is actually an invitation. Likewise, the best conversations are isomorphic to that. They have a certain partiality to it because you don't know where you're going to go. But that doesn't mean you don't know that you're going. Like, that's the weird thing. You know that you're going. And I think what can happen in some of like the debate structures is it feels like they already know where they are. Like, this is my position. That's your position. And let's fight it out. So it doesn't feel like a partial object. But when you see Peterson on the stage, it feels like a quote unquote partial object. And so then I think that's really important because then it also helps us locate the disagreement that seems to be generative. Whereas in the Daily Wire debate, the disagreement is between Destiny and Peterson. Whereas when Peterson is on the stage, it's almost more in himself, the kind of disagreement or the wrestling that's going on, right? Now, again, I'm not saying there's no place for IQ squared debates or Daily Wire debates because they can be generative as well if both people come in with the right orientation or, or a certain openness to one another. So I'm not saying there's no role, but it's very interesting to see those differences. And let me put it this way. You definitely need both. And um, there's something about human beings, though, that seem to leave. We, we as a human race, and then I'll give it to Joel, seem more likely to make the mistake of getting rid of the walking around on the stage partial object conversation in favor of the debate versus the other way around. Like, it seems more natural to make that mistake than the mistake of walking around and never having a debate like an IQ squared thing, right? Because we almost like the uh, the visual fight. We like seeing that. There's something dopamine about it. So it seems like we're more likely to make that mistake. I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. Let me give it to Joel Teton and then Javier. Joel, it is a pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you for coming today. I hope you are well. Thanks, Daniel. I am, yeah. Hello, everybody, and uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have seen this topic kind of in your headlines for a few weeks. So I've had it I've had it on my mind as part of what's going on at the net. Um, and I jotted down a few notes, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the example of when there was the Peterson Zizek debate. And it was Zizek who was like, no, it's not going to be a debate. It's going to be a conversation. It's going to be positive and, uh, you know, mutually upbuilding towards towards some uh, common goal. So, yeah, I mean, in a lot of my writing, I've been thinking about what are kind of the metaphysical or, or basic philosophical requirements in order to believe that people can communicate ac across difference. Um, you know, Daniel and I talked about pure coherence versus, you know, the world sort of breaking in and some some common ground between people. Um, but I'm also thinking in this conversation about kind of the psychological conditions for that occurring. And, you know, one example of this is um, something I've been learning through like uh, uh, marriage advice stuff from uh, the Gottmans. If you guys know about them, they talk about uh, criticism and contempt as to any way of these uh, four horsemen that just derail marriages, but any other conversations as well. Um, you know, and, and even just this example here between the alternative to criticism being an honest kind of complaint, which is totally legitimate. Um, here's a criticism. You never think about how your behavior is affecting other people. I don't believe you are. Uh, you never think of others. You never think of me. <laughs> Okay, there's a criticism. That's going to put the other person on the defensive. This is going nowhere. Complaint, totally legitimate. I was scared when you were running late and didn't call me. I thought we had agreed that we would do that for each other. And it just sort of opens up to the other person to sort of, it's like it's like ping pong. I'm shooting the, the ball over the, the net. You know, it's your, your turn to hit it back. Um, it, it raises the problem, like the potential difference that's that's there but with an openness to to learning more and that that other person can correct it or that you may have misunderstood. Um, and the same for these other uh, aspects. But yeah, um, you know, I, I think about it with any online interaction. There's so much of a tendency to go straight to criticism or contempt um, and therefore to invite defensiveness. But yeah, when we actually want to learn and grow we can't be in that uh, defensive state we also can't be as we've been talking about just standing for what i already think you know 
because really that's just power. That's like war. <laughs> that's just like flags fighting. Um, but if, if you are trying to, to learn and grow, yeah, and it, it's, it's funny. Um, since you're talking about the daily wire, I'll, I'll go with it. They, they do the daily wire backstage conversations and the tone really changes, you know, you, you still have these, you know, opinionated guys, uh, you know, sh shooting the breeze, but, but there's more of a conversational thing going on. And my wife and always, I always sit down and listen to those and, and think, man, what if we could recapture this and in other ways. So, you know, that, that's a thought of, it's just like the very way that we, uh, we, that we go about the disagreement, even the very words that we put it in determine whether we are working with that other person to a common end or not. Um, and you know, that, that idea of encountering a limit to, you know, I, I heard these comments from this entrepreneur. Um, she was talking about a bunch of billionaires and that in any conversation they go into it in order to information gather. And I was thinking about the contrast there with people of any given ideology that they come into a conversation to propound what they already think. Um, at, but, but the reason the billionaires do that is because they want to learn and grow and uh, accomplish practical goals and financial goals better, <laughs> you know, and wh whatever we might think of their role in uh, late stage capitalism or whatever, um, they are learning how the world works and uh, acting effectively within it. So, yeah, I think uh, trying to encounter our limits and, and information gathering and then exhibiting that in the very way that we frame disagreement and uh, invite discussion with other people is, is all important. That was brilliant. I really like those points. And now I almost want to do like a comparison of like a Peterson daily wild public Peterson backstage Peterson wrestling with God. And that would be quite fascinating. And I think, and, and everyone should know that Joel's work on so quick Kipsky uh, is magnificent language philosophy in the natural theologian is really, really well put. And I really enjoyed speaking with Joel about that. And definitely, if we don't believe in the possibility of, oh, I don't know, communicating with other people. Um, yeah, okay. Well, this is great. Uh, things are going to go great. Try that in marriage. Honey, I'd love to speak with you, but words don't mean anything. The signifier doesn't cross the gap of the signified. So I can't take out the trash today, hon. I wanted to, but there was this infinite gap of difference. I just couldn't do it, hon. I'm so freaking sorry. Uh, so that's really good. I'll pass it to Chitan, Javier, and then Clayton. I really like also the difference between criticism and contempt. That's really good. And I'm also like, it's interesting to me because I always have a soft spot, like a really big soft spot for the commutative rationality of Habermas, where he's talking about basically without commutative rationality, we're done for. But the issue for me, um, like I haven't read all of Habermas, so I don't mean this as a criticism. He may address it somewhere. He's written a lot. He's, I think, like 95 now and still writing. I hope when I'm 95, I'm still, you know, chilling like that. So whatever, man. Uh, Charles, him and Charles Taylor are like 90. It's like, okay, cool. Um, but, you know, it's like the problem is our, the way we communicate is so context dependent. Because obviously when Peterson is daily wider, there's a bit of an audience capture, right? Can't blame the man. It's a business. Backstage a little less. Because the people who are willing to like get more probably want a little more depth than just beating up their opponents. And then people who are going to wrestle with God, well, they're just in, they're just in the trenches. So you can like, it changes. Well, if that's the case, then commutative rationality, if there's something to what Habamas is talking about that we need or dialogo, circling, all of these different things, well, they seem to be very context uh, dependent, environmental dependent, situation dependent. Should we be able to overcome that or not? I think that's just an element of the conversation that has to be thought. So I really appreciate you bringing that out. I'll pass it to Chitan, Javier, and Clayton. Chitan, it is good to see you, sir. How are you today? It's a very interesting conversation going on. Um, and I haven't sort of, uh, I'm, I'm entering into it uh, without much in, in, in that sense, anything in my arsenal in that sense. And I haven't seen uh, Peterson and uh, Destiny. I saw it on the YouTube being presented. I just get over it, you know, very nicely. Um, I, I, I like Peterson's uh, small wheels. I can't tolerate him to that degree. I can't see the whole conversation with him unless he's debating Jack. You know, that is fun still. Um, but uh, I, I think the conversation sort of got, got interesting when it started thinking about uh, this question of communications relationship with disagreement in that sense. Uh, I teach a course on communication sort of uh, each year and uh, 
uh, one of the things I struggle with my students is to sort of bring co idea of communication out of the formalistic style of you know learning how to communicate, learning how to speak English well. And especially in India, English is a resource for you know if you know English, you will get a job and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, getting out of that and thinking about communication as an engagement with difference in that sense, you know, engagement with disagreement. And, you know, that discussion goes on. And what role does thinking, your ability to think, pl plays in your ability to communicate? You know, and I structured that course. But each year, I feel that there's something lacking in that course also, to be honest. Um, you know, in spite of, uh, am I, I think uh, I lost you all. We're still here. We heard your beautiful voice. I think what's lacking is singing. You got to incorporate singing. That's what makes <laughs> exactly. it different. Exactly. Friends, where I'm friends, <laughs> friends, friends, but then it's... <laughs> That's where I'm going, basically. You know, the each, you know, but each year what happens is by the time you're sort of coming to the end of the course, which is out about now, uh, you start thinking about something about incorporating non-linear thinking within this stream of, you know, that... Uh, well, you know, how do you start start incorporating something like engagement with stories, which which cannot be uh, where where conversation is not simply with in that sense. Uh, you know, you think first and you speak. In that sense, all our discussion is around that on that on that line, which is very very Arendtian point that thinking itself is a form of action. What if we inverse it, inverse Arendt's supposition to us and say, can action be a form of thinking? In what context that is possible? And you can, for some kind of reference, go back to certain kind of Sufi stories. You know, for instance, one story that comes to my mind is that the Sufi master is very attached to his uh, of his pupils. And other people are very jealous of, uh, you know, that one person. The Sufi master wants to teach them a lesson. So what he does is he gives them all a bird. And he says, go and kill this bird where nobody can see you. And, you know, all 20 of them goes and 19 of them kill the bird. Uh, one person doesn't. So when they come back, they ask the question that, why didn't you, you know, why did all of these people kill and you didn't kill? He said, I, I, I couldn't find a place that God, could, God couldn't see me. <laughs> you know, uh, there is something about um, uh, this form of communication that remains left out of the way we conventionally think about communication you know which which we can't um, um, uh, process or assimilate within our with that within our thinking and this also maps nicely upon sort of things that I'm thinking about these days uh, in my own you know for research and thinking in that sense the distinction between neurotic and psychotic structures uh, in Lacan uh, in if you think about the psychotic structure, in psychotic structure, thinking can't can't be done before action in that sense. They will simply reject it, which is why psychotic is such a huge issue for modern societies. Uh, with psychotic, thinking has to be done through action, which is what James Joyce's example was of Lacan in that in, in that sense. And there is there is some kind of a of a cut that misses the mystical uh, elements of this kind, this kind of non-linear thinking can make. You know, uh, in these discussions in, 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 a, in a contemporary modern, um, I'm also reading this great ethnographic work by this person called Stefanio um, uh, something. It's, it's a work specifically uh, linking uh, psychoanalysis with uh, the, psych the, the, the psychoanalysis structured around the psychotic structure uh, with the, the Islamic mystical, uh, the, the work is done in Egypt with, with you know, um, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Islamic mystics in in in, in, in region, region, and I think there is there is something to be said about thinking about communication from this angle. Uh, what what can communication give us when when we completely in, 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 incorporate not only seeing something from a different perspective as a as a ritualized idea that okay I will look at it from your perspective you look at look at it from my perspective. But finding a different angle to enter into a conversation, which completely disrupts these conventional rules and modes of modus operandi that we set for ourselves, you know, we, and which anybody who's who's minimally trained in certain kind of spiritual traditions or certain kind of mystical elements would do, would know it very immediately. This is happening to me. For instance, I can give you a cone, something like this. Go and find two flowers of the same shape for my for me. And you will go, you struggle, and until you reach the realization that you can't have 
any two things with nature with the same shape. You'll keep on struggling to find, you know, uh, and what is this communication entailing in that sense? And how, what, what is the, what is the mode of entry into this kind of thought? I, something we need to think about, which we don't understand too well in our times, I guess. Yeah. That's outstanding. And um, definitely introduce singing, tap dancing can help with communication. Um, people love costumes. You can put on costumes that might be good, you know, just different things. I mean, I'm really taken by this question on like action leading to thinking. It makes me think a bit <clears throat> because it's also like you wouldn't think about, wait, there are no two flowers exactly the same until you do the action of trying. And then there's also something about the action of your context, like where you speak, like we were saying with Joel there, that changes how you speak. So it's very interesting that the quality of speech or what you say or how you think does seem to be tied to some sort of action, some sort of lived experience. I mean, you mentioned James Joyce, the whole like stream of consciousness is it, it seems like thinking, it's like there's a way in which you say stream of consciousness is pure thought, but in a way it's kind of almost like pure action where you don't let yourself, that you just, it's like you just let yourself write whatever comes to mind. Is that thinking? It seems to really kind of blur the line between action and thinking. It's actually really hard to do like a Gertrude Stein, Faulkner, whatever stream of consciousness to just let whatever's in you come out, which of course gets into, I guess, some like uh, psychoanalytical methods. And that's just very interesting. And then it also makes me think, and then I would give it to Javier and Clayton, like on Clayton's wonderful podcast, I think it was Paula who was saying that one of the ways she defined her work was the idea of being who she saw herself as, being seen that way by other people, that she didn't create impressions that she's like, where would you get that impression from? Like that her public and private self we're not so divided in a way, is, is a way I kind of took that. I think it's interesting. It's, it's almost like there, how you speak non-publicly is an action that determines how you speak publicly. So be aware of how you talk, like what you do, like the action of choosing a certain consistency through your life actually then impacts how you communicate in all areas, right? Or in private. And it's interesting to think how those things kind of tie together where, because you were mentioning the Sufi story of, I couldn't think of where to go where God was not watching. It's almost like, I can't think where I could go that what I choose to do will not have an impact on my relationships in the public sphere. Like wherever I go, the public is there in a way, which in one sense is big brother and terrifying, but in another sense, should suggest a certain reality that you ought to condition yourself to, or you almost have to like artificiate the self or create masks or play various games. So there's, I mean, you have to have a division between the public and private. We've talked about this before because if not, you end up captured, but there's something about that division that also suggests part of the work is awareness that wherever you go in your life, you are conditioning yourself for all the other areas of your life, almost like a Bergson kind of hologram or something like that. So it just, it made me think of Clayton's talk, but let me give it to Rivera and then Clayton, and then I'll have to go on a little bit, but let me pass it to Mr. Rivera. Mr. Rivera. Yeah, I mean, what, what Chetan was bringing up, um, it actually reminded me a little bit of what I've been thinking about with negative pragmatics. Um, and then... It also made me think how the, even the psychoanalytic tradition of free association is kind of like that, which Chetan is talking about, action, that the action itself is a kind of thinking, as if promoting what, what, what can you associate with this, and so on. And then it reveals itself by associating as an action itself what, what perhaps is being thought about. What is the... What is the subject saying? What is the story that the subject is saying? Um, another thing that I was going to bring up, something that I think Joe touched on, um, was I wanted to talk about the sort of foundationalist <laughs> background of it all. And, and, and this is what allows Chitan to even uh, basically talk about why we need to think about like non-traditional forms of of talking about conversations and, and communication because um what joe said about um how to approach conversations like this would be a criticism and then this would be a, like a an opening right now what's interesting is that in my conversations with my own partner 
this is what my partner would have said. And then <laughs> my partner would say, if you frame it like that, then I feel like that's just manipulation. Because what you want to say is you want to say the criticism, but now you're just being nice about it. So you're just going to say it in another way. Right? That's how my partner would frame it. What's the problem with that? The problem with that, and this was a conversation that we had, I said, the problem with what's being proposed <laughs> is basically that we are both coming from positions that we cannot prove to each other. I cannot prove to you that I am being honest and not manipulating you, right? The same way with the other side. I cannot, like, a person that typically manipulates isn't going to say, yeah, you're right, I was manipulating you. That's not what they're going to say, right? But what you can see here is that because it can't be proven, and this goes back to the notion of trust again, you have to take that leap of, I hope you trust me when I say this, when I frame it in this way, that this is what I mean, right? So it adds another element of trust in the conversation because even if, I change my words and I put it nicer or something like that, people can still look at it as, oh, you're just kind of painting something with some, you know, rose, rose glasses kind of thing um, to, to hide what you really want to say. And it'd be hard to disprove that because fundamentally, like, it's just your word against theirs at this point, right? Um, and, and that's usually what's very difficult to have conversations um, because the moment the other person gets a a hint of that there might be possibly there there might possibly be a an idea of malintent in the conversation that's when it starts going out the window very quickly um but basically once i address this issue of like what's difficult about it even if even if i was being manipulative is that it's hard it's hard to give ground and concreteness to it in, in, a, in a sort of general fact. Um, and I was like, you know, like in my personal opinion, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I am right. This is, this is me opening the conversation, but you could say that the, the question is asked or the question that can be proposed is, is manipulation or the concept of manipulation, the only possibility for this form of communication that is being expressed right now. Is that the only form possible? Um, and it, it's that kind of framing that, that starts to leave open. But anyways, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that briefly, how it kind of still has to cultivate a, a ground of trust and love, which is why I always like psychoanalysis in a sense, because um, I think even taking to Lacan's point, uh, his interview in like the 1970s where he says, let's get rid of this idea of the average Joe, right? He goes, because all my times I've talked to a person and there's nothing average about them. They all have their very peculiar, specific things about them. Um, and I think when most people have conversations, like we, I think, uh, what is it? Um, Philip talked about the medium of communication, right? Like Twitter versus here. Um, you could say Twitter is that easy knee-jerk reaction to jump into somebody uh, expressing a characterization of a certain position. Like the biggest, the big example would be like someone's like, "I'm against abortion." And you're like, "Okay, I know all the arguments to um, fight against somebody that's against abortion or something like that." That's the the temptation that's always had in the the characterization of of our enemy. We we characterize the enemy in that sense is always a partial object like you say uh daniel it's always a partial object we're always working with some type of phantasm about what we believe the argument and the person actually believes which isn't entirely true and sometimes you might even discover with having longer conversations about somebody that it's not even that their position their admiration for like being for abortion or not is not even about that this is this is what I enjoy about the concept of free association because you can start to 
follow a kind of nonlinear path that start to kind of reflect possibly what's wanting to be expressed and what's wanting to be said. Um, and it's funny because usually association is, is, is kind of seen as like, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's always has, it's, you know, uh, it's not seen well for a lot of people. Right. Um, but I do think there's a kind of advantage to that kind of conversation and, and it is a kind of way of getting the conversation going and to keep it going. Um, so yeah, this, this idea, um, and then I, I want to touch on what I call negative pragmatics, by the way, negative pragmatics, I kind of looked at as this question of what do we do with lack as a, as a pragmatic function, basically. Um, and it's very unclear as of yet, because when we talk about pragmatism, there's always this conversation about usefulness. What's the purpose? Lack seems to defy that. And yet at the same time, um, what we're attempting about, you know, action is thinking or um, keep the conversation going. I think keeping the conversation going, ironically, would be a form of negative pragmatics, I would say. Mainly because for people, it would be like there is no tangible expression of this purpose, and yet there is. Um, but it's always evading what Chaton had commented on my writing before. It's always evading the the immediacy of what is presenting. Um, and so negative pragmatics is, is is trying to deal with the fact that immediacy is always evading us. Like the immediacy always passes, whatever, however we want to phrase it. <laughs> however we want to phrase it. We cannot hold on to the immediacy. That's the problem. So negative pragmatics is 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 useful in that sense. And how do we think about the fact that we can't hold on to the immediacy and that it always escapes us? And so then it, it, it the pragmatic is, what do I do with all this wastefulness? I don't know if that's the right word, this excess of waste this uselessness um that those are pragmatic questions but not pragmatic questions in the sense of you immediately know what to do with it but yeah i'll end it there no that's excellent and i i definitely think like the it, it makes me think of what is uh what is the pragmatism of the parcel object you know what is the practical way to relate to partial objects how if you can't know everything what's practical it's hard to be practical if you can't know everything well it you know it based on like the illic class it would bring a difference between being prepared versus planning like you know negative you'd have to be more on the side of being prepared for the unknown versus planning everything and i think i think that's a very good question what are the practical implications of lack and like what's the if if your wife or your friends are partial objects then how you practice around them, what is the correct way to hold yourself will be very different than if they're not. If you're part of a story that's glimpsing a theme, the practice of that will be very different than if you're just at the DMV. And then I'll pass it to Clayton here, the last thing. Um, like you were talking about abortion, Bernard, my my beloved Bernard once said that most people's like conversations are like a board game. Like abortion is like, okay, let's play the abortion game now. You're pro-choice, I'm pro-life. Let me get my cards, okay. The incest card, yeah, what about incest? All right, women's right. Like it's just like a game that there are preset roles and preset arguments that are all in the board. Or if you talk about like uh, like government spending, okay, who's the central planner? Okay, who's for the free market? Who's got the argument? It's just like a board. And it's and that's very, it's like the opposite of a story in that sense, where most conversations that try to get into deep issues almost have this kind of board game monopoly structure uh, versus a story, which is more open. And story would certainly be the practice of lack Whereas a board game, you know the end. You know everything ahead of time. You know it's you. There's no there's no openness because you don't you don't know who's gonna win, but you know that somebody's gonna win, or that we're gonna walk away not having our minds changed or not come up with any ideas outside of the deck of cards that we have. So I was thinking about that. There's more to be said. I'm thinking now about the free association conversation, and there is something where every conversation I think takes place over a void. Uh, because it's like a tightrope, because if I question your motives or if I don't trust you, the whole thing collapses instantly, which is one of the reasons why I think they can be magnificent. Uh, but let me give it to Clayton and then pass it to Luber Chiton. So Clayton, please. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it looks like it's uh, haircut season, I guess, <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> Another form of communication, I guess. Uh, you know, speaking of communication, like everyone has said some really uh, good things there, which I completely agree with and, and I want to add to. Uh, it reminded me of um, a course taught by Taylor Barrett, uh, he's put it on uh, the Raveki Foundation now, where he he structured this like thirteen week course uh, where he's trying to teach communication and and taking all these different like dialogues and circling and and all these other you know philosophies and kind of like concentrating saturating them. <laughs> That's what you call it here. Right. And to 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 a point that you can, if you go through that experience, all the things we're talking about would then be added to your repertoire, and then now you can play with them. Like you can start using those skill sets. So uh, that's what that all this talk has reminded me about. And more specifically was the the concept of authentic relating, where there's this idea that. It's not an idea, it's more like a practice, uh, the practice of revealing yourself. Uh, the, 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 the way it works is that if you keep revealing your intent and your context to the best of your ability, then it allow, it invites in the other you're trying to commune with to, into that space, into your eye space. And so... If they do it the same way, so both your eye spaces start to get synced into, you know, like a really good we space. And in the we space, then now you you start to work to maintain that we space because you you sort of like know the limits, each other's limits. Speaking of Mr. Ebert's <laughs> limits, limitlessness of the limits, right? Because it seems to me the like the example Javier is giving about knowing what the partner would say. It, it, it's it's like you know how the limits of your partner shape their experience or their interpretation of events, and so therefore you can account for that when you uh, interact. And um, if I take that back to you know that example we've spoken before about me trying to understand. <laughs> what my wife was saying in the kitchen is similarly the same. It's like, well, what are the other limits intervening um, with her communication to me uh, that limits how much I can, I can sort of like take out of it. And so once I understand that, then I know what to, to prioritize and what to deprioritize. It's like, oh, that's just a, a piece of the structure of the conversation. This is the real content that I need to pay attention. This is the, the felt expression that they're struggling with. And this is what they're curious about. This is what they're wondering about. So once I know that structure, then it allows me to relate to it appropriately. And then I can we can keep exploring the, the, the limitlessness of it. And, and then it keeps going and it keeps going because it's never ending. It's it's always dynamic, and you can just choose to stop it. And like I say, uh, you know, with with this whole podcasting recently, it's so interesting because if you talk to someone long enough, <laughs> you get to their wisdom. Like like you listen to someone long enough, and 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 you walk, you try to get in, you try to understand what they're saying, you quickly get to what they mean. And when you do that, all of a sudden, they sound really wise from their perspective. And it doesn't mean you have to consume it and you have to take it, but, but you will appreciate uh, their wisdom and why it is structured the way it is. And I think like a good mark of um, communication is, in, is when you get to that place. And when you get to that place, you develop a new perspective of this person. You develop a new respect for them because now you know the limits they are working with. <laughs> and so if, without knowing those limits, it's very difficult because you may try to change their mind. You may try to convert them into your, your, your own shape of thinking. 
but your shape of thinking is limited by your limits. And so, so you have your own intentions as to what that only allowed you to think the way you think. And so I think develop being aware of that and, and trying to cultivate a space that allows someone to, you know, complete their expression of whatever it is they're expressing through their limits can then allow for them to get to a place where they complete the expression. But also if you can show them how that's landing and how what kind of sense it's making to you who is outside of that, then it also gives them an opportunity to understand how they come across. And then they can edit in some cases, right? Like if, if you're because it's a long enough connection, right? They can edit it, they can correct it and reconnect. And you get to a place where people they'll tell you they feel understood, right? They they feel like you get what they mean, which is the thing we spoke about language, right? It's like you cut through the, the words and start transmitting the meaning. And so I no longer worry about the words you're saying because now I can hear your intent. I can almost listen to you, to the spirit with which you speak and the spirit of where you speak from. And when I can do that, then I don't really care about what you're saying. It's like someone will complain, oh, Daniel said this. I'm like, yeah, but he meant this, right? It's like every time he says that, it means this, you need to remap it. But if they don't know how to remap Daniel's language and Daniel's speech, they kind of go like, I don't know what that guy is talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I can get why they don't because they haven't done the other extra bit of remapping. And so there's always a remapping required for you to get out of the the limit so that you can see where the, the spirit is, where where the life is of what they're talking about. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go on too long. Uh, no, I'll, that's I'll that's that. outstanding. And when people hear me say that I eat pineapple sandwiches with mayonnaise, and they're like, "What does that guy mean?" Clayton's like, "No, no, let me remap that." And then Clayton later finds out that no, that's what he meant. He meant pineapple sandwiches with mayonnaise and white bread that his grandfather gave him as a, a wee little lad. Uh, I really like that phrase, wee mapping, though. That's really good. the remapping is really good. The eye space is great. I think it's interesting, too, because like everything you're talking about, and then I'll give it to Luber and Cheetan, and then we'll come to a close. Alas, I'll have to run, but I've enjoyed this. They're, like that whole thinking the context, getting what they mean, that's like an action. That's an action and then thinking. There's a kind of action in that that you're choosing to engage in that then changes the communication that has to be done. That determines the context that the communication takes place in. And I think... I think we've thought too long about conversation as not needing any pre-action per se, or like tilling of the soil. We just, you just talk. No, you have to think of these other things. If you just talk, you might hit each other and you might, and you might not be ready for that and you might misunderstand. And I, I like also what you're saying. If you talk to someone long enough, you get to their wisdom. It's almost like it's almost like you need to guide someone via their own free association to the limit, so they ex to their limit, so they experience it as a creative unfolding of their wisdom. Whereas too often in debate structures, you throw their limit at them too early, so then it's not experienced as a creative, but a wall that hits them, right? So it's almost like the difference between guiding a person through their own associations, their free association, quote unquote, to the place of their limits where then the wisdom breaks through as opposed to throwing at it too, too soon. And then there's not enough story per se. There's not enough development to where their wisdom can come through. They become, they attack too soon. So I was thinking that, but let me give it to Luber and then Cheetah. Mr. Luber. I'm just thinking about what Javier said than what Clayton said. And I think there's an interesting line where if you're too revealing all the time and you're as completely transparent as possible all the time, what happens is your your honesty could be in question. Kind of what like Javier was saying. Where it's like, are you just saying that because of X and you truly desire Y and you're saying it X because of some, you know, concept or whatever it may be like um i think i think that's still a question how to walk that line and ultimately 
how to walk that line helps one not be in a circuit because you can then you can then not see the circuit as absolute it's like you're easy like in your in your intimate relationship you're in your like close friends and whatnot um if you if you can walk that line then you can have a long lasting friendship that's the thing and in that sense um you'll go into different phases of that friendship different circuits if you will and um yeah i, I kind of just wanted to say that and just i think walking the line if i had to give an answer it's very context dependent and i think it's just there is no absolute sense of walking the line um i think there's a very context dependent way of walking the line that requires a certain lens of looking which for me that would be like storytelling but like it's 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 interesting to think about um the mediums of different storytelling throughout the the years and how these mediums like manifest and how they affect this line in a certain sense um cell phones you know that's a medium that allows people to walk a line in a fundamentally fundamentally different way than they than like 30 years ago so um things are ex more acceptable now in a certain sense in walking that line than they were 30 years ago in walking that line so i think uh what does it mean to walk that line right now um it's a very tough to and this this goes to something Javier asked a question about when I was talking to him like last week where it's like if the contradiction so to speak the negativity is happening at such immense speed like what do you what do you do at that point like uh and I and I just think it's very tough you just it's very tough right now and the only way to really do it is kind of being a being a, a a storyteller and having to just have that um absolute choice in things and and i think that i'm what i'm interested about is how is that going to change in 30 years from now because i don't think it's going to be i think it to some extent it will be an absolute choice of some like story so to speak but i do think there's going to be more to that uh to the pattern because there's just going to be more mediums that throw off how the pattern is moving right now. And I just wonder what is the through line through all these different pattern variations. Um, and that to me is like, it's a very myopic focus, but I think if focus and only focused on that, it actually illuminates everything else in, in a crazy way. And, and, uh, yeah, I would for that for me that's theme. Like I, I I'm I'm reading Levanas, uh, I can't say his name right now, and he just brings up the word in such a descriptive way in his sentences, but never actually like addresses the word itself and like and kind of investigates the word and and uh I just think it's a very mysterious thing. So I, I just wonder uh why that's the case. I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm rambling now. But I'll pass off to whoever. You are not rambling. And the way that we walk the line is by singing in Cheetan's class. That is the way. It is quite clear. Um. So I appreciate. It. I I I mean, what you described about walking the line in the parallax course, we talked about dynamics. How every new type technology brings about new dynamics, new kind of pitch and risk, game theory dynamics. Uh, how many different terms can I throw out that you have to be aware of and pay attention to? to pay attention to all while all the technology and complexity is removing your capacity for attention, which makes it very difficult because there's some line that has to be walked that it becomes harder and harder to see. It seemingly becomes thinner. It seemingly becomes longer and it becomes more difficult to identify the dynamics that are trying to knock you off. That also makes me think of the rate of unveiling that Dante has to undergo with Beatrice. If it's too quick, he's reduced to ash. If it's too slow, he can't find his way to ascend. So these, these, these complicated balancing acts that I think we can associate with storytelling. Um, it also makes me think like on it, it, like it, uh, you know, Mr. Jockin was here and, you know, theme beauty, 
the, you know, at the beginning, we said, what is this uh, thing that we're trying to stop being distorted from seeing or trying to think? Um, seemingly, it has some ability to walk across that tightrope at the beginning of the Spoke Zarathustra and some sort of sign of it uh, seems to be, as we talked about, self-forgetfulness, we forgetfulness, beauty, theme, this kind of unfolding where you encounter your limits and yet your limits don't destroy you. They, in fact, become invitations to something creative, and you're able to freely associate with life, uh, perhaps, without needing it to all be planned out ahead of time. That was a lot of very hysteric things, but let me pass it on to Chitan, and, uh, and then I'll bring it to a close. Chitan, please. Uh, I'll quickly maybe uh, come back to Javier's sort of provocation on free association. We can actually... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not sort of get into too much theory because it will take us too long to get to the point, maybe with an example, it would be easier to think about this. So let's say obsessive walks into a, you know, therapy. And you know, in therapy conversations are not like we are discussing them to be. So the obsessive walks into a therapist's office and he says that, you know, I procrastinate a lot and I want you to give me tasks as a therapist and see that I finish my tasks on time. You know, this kind of, an, and of course, therapist cannot satisfy the demand of the obsessive. That's the first line of psychoanalysis that the therapist would actually Im Im immediately say, you know, tell me more about what you are thinking in procrastination or why do you think you procrastinate or what happens to you? You know, some some kind of uh, uh, lack of fulfillment of the demand, some kind of frustration would be introduced by a therapist such that this uh, the desire of the analyst can, can, can be, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, privileged or pro pro propagated in that sense in, in the therapy session. Uh, on the flip side, if a psychotic sort of walks into the therapy, therapist office, uh, you would immediately find that uh, find that that there the therapist can't do this exercise. There the therapist has to become the secretary secretary of the of the analyst stand. He has to give him the task. He has to uh, structure himself through the task of the you know. So, for instance, in a psychotic structure, something like this would be happening. Where in a psychotic structure, a psychotic is sort of wrapping herself with a, with a uh, you know, uh, cell in paper, you know, that uh, bubble wrap in that sense. Because she sort of says that her body feels like disintegrating. She feels her body is spreading everywhere and the, and the bubble wrap actually helps her contain her body. And the therapist's answer to her would not be, oh, what are you feeling when you're doing this? She wouldn't be. It will come the or what are your memories of your childhood? So this any of those kind of questions will not work. A ther good therapist answer can be something like this: Can you see your own clothes? And would that relieve you with the same give you the same effect that you're, you're getting from this wrapping your own body? Uh, the the in both cases, Javier is right. There is some kind of action thinking going on. But there is something different happening in the latter case than that is not happening in the obsessive case. If you can see it. In the obsessive case, the unconscious things, definitely. In the obsessive case, the, the free association is actually leading us back to, in some senses, certain repression that has happened within, you know, and this, this connection back to of effect to the, uh, you know, memory in that sense. In the psychotic case, something distinctly different is happening, but... How do we mark that distinction? And I'm not giving, as I said, I will not try and theorize it. I'll, I'll resist trying to give a theory upon this, this problem. But communication shifts over there. Something drastically shifts in that bubble wrap example, where it's not moving through, uh, you're not coming back to some kind of thinking at some point of time. Where thinking has to happen through the spring of clothes itself. And something will happen through that to, through which, uh, you know, this kind of engagement is being uh, uh, structured. I think modern society can still think free association. The modern world we live in can still sort of uh, think free association in that sense. We can't think this, uh, uh, this kind of a relationship with. And by the way, this, is, this, this example I've taken from Bruce, Bruce Fink's work and Darren Leader's work. You know, uh, just to maybe put it out there. Uh, this psychotic uh, th structure example, I don't think we can think. We don't even have any kind of uh, way to structure this in our education system also. You know, what are the ways of engagement? And is this way only there for psychotic structure? 
or is there something within this this example that can benefit that we all can incorporate in our education systems? Is I think something I was I'm trying to sort of maybe uh, you know provoke all of us within that sense. Well, I love bubble wrap. Maybe next week we'll talk about bubble wrap. You just spend all the time in the garage popping it and different things and. Maybe I wasn't wearing clothes. I don't know. I would just sit out there in my diaper and pump that stuff. That's fascinating. I don't have any thought. I'm not. That's really interesting. I will have to ponder that. I appreciate it. I appreciate that very much, Chitan. I think that's putting your finger on something very profound. Um, I, as alas, I will have to run. I, I also, um, as as um, Luba was describing the circuit, that made me think of the board game. You're kind of stuck in this loop, and that's not really the story that has this unfolding structure. I'm also thinking. A little bit where Javier, the way, yeah, like conversations take place over a kind of void. Like at any moment, they could be destroyed. It's like you're watching a type rope. All I have to say is, I don't believe you. What can you do? Like if I don't trust you, if I don't assume the best, if I think you have bad intentions, there's like nothing you can do. Um, good to see you, Mr. Luber. Thank you. So it's like it's taking place over a void in a sense. And, you know, if reality has some sort of negativity to it and reality takes place over a void in some sense, rather it's a product of excess and in a uh, excess meaning a finite frame or it's a result of a fundamental negativity, it's almost like then conversation and reality have the same structure. They're kind of isomorphic in some different ways. They're both taking place over a kind of uh, void that at any moment, well, that's what we see, right? Like if you... If you look for a transcendental ground in reality, that can lead to all sorts of pathologies, right? You know, you, you got to give up that and become more Hegelian, right? If you look for that transcendental ground, it's a problem. It's almost like if you go into a conversation and question it and you're like, where's the trust? That's like looking for a transcendental ground. And in the same way, it led to a lot of trouble in thinking in the modern world. It immediately leads to trouble in conversations and relationships. So it's interesting how there's almost kind of a isomorphic uh, structure to that, where it has something very similar. That being the case, it would seem as if what's interesting is that that very ground of conversation that makes it be potentially generative is the never seeking a transcendental ground like you just relate you don't look for that ground. you just assume the trust you assume the genuineness you assume the other person you don't question their motives in the same way that it's almost like you need to assume the world you need to assume the thing is there and then philosophize with it not looking for something under it and you need to do that in relationships and what's very interesting is it seems like conversations are most generative when you indeed are willing to, uh, you know, walk across the void and not look down, not question the ground, right? That's when the conversations can have a relationships can have a more generative structure. Likewise, it seems as if life can be more generative if you don't look for that transcendental grounding, right? Once you start looking for it, you just enter you have various as uh, various insanities and different things, right? And likewise, relationships get destroyed if the trust is not given. And we and Michelle has a lovely paper on trust and belonging again. And it just makes me think then if at the beginning of Zarathustra, the man on the tightrope, the tightrope walker, it's as if every single conversation in a way is like walking the tightrope. Like in the same way that in reality, not looking is like walking the tightrope. And we have to like holding the line that Mr. Luba would say is almost like, how do you stay on that tightrope without falling into the void? How do you like keep walking without slipping off, right? Well, Joel was saying about like openness, the psychology, like these different methods of speaking. There's all these different, it's not one way. It's like a tool belt of different things. It, you know, it's not one skill that makes you able to walk across a tightrope. It's a whole set of skills that you have. Precisely because there is such risk, though, when walking the tightrope, if the person's able to do it, it's magnificent. People go to shows to see it. It's something magnificent, right? I think likewise, precisely because a conversation can be so freaking precarious, at any moment, somebody could disagree or question motives or it could die because we have our positions or it becomes boring at any moment conversation could turn into warfare or fail. That's why when it doesn't, if it keeps going in the way Javier said, there's a certain magnificence to it. And suddenly five hours have gone by and you don't know where it goes. And you have all these communities with the dialogos or the circling, these kind of sense. It is very interesting how much people associate intimacy with conversation and the ability to speak, right? And it's interesting then if speaking has this precarious 
structure to it, just like tightrope walking, then maybe that's one of the reasons why speech seems to be central in all of these exercises of human beings that can be so uniquely magnificent, rather it be in friendship, relationship, circling, conversation, like all of these different things. There's some sort of tapping into a certain magnificence there that maybe is healing. Maybe that's why so much of like talk therapy, maybe there's something in like figuring out the right ways to say, to stay on the tightrope varies. And it seems to change from the psychotic structure to the neurotic. Like it's not the same tightrope for everyone, but figuring out the right way to speak seems to be well, what to say on that wonderful example with the bubble wrap knowing what to say seems to be somehow tied to staying on the tightrope. And of course, walking a tightrope requires courage because it's kind of scary because you might die, right? So there's also something about this kind of conversation that has a courage to it, which, you know, going into the therapist office, there's a courage that requires that they're going to be digging deep. Likewise, if you allow someone in a conversation about your worldview to make you hit the limits of your worldview, conservatism, liberalism, that's kind of scary. But the very act of doing that, ah, now we're tightrope walking. Now we're in story. Now we're doing something magnificent. And if you never feel, if you never feel that bit of fear, then you might not be walking a tightrope. And that means you've either already fallen into the void or you're standing on the side not doing anything magnificent, right? And there's something about the human that needs to be that, that tightrope walker. And I think that is in that very act, which seems to be courageous. And also when you're on a tightrope, I'll, I'll note, you automatically are limited now. You can't walk to your left or right. There is a limit there. You have to go straight or you will die. Likewise, when you're in a conversation like this, there are certain limitations. You can't just bring up studies that everyone has to read or like you can't like attack someone's, um, I'm doing a little robot thing. You can't attack someone's motives or the conversation fails. So there are things you are limited from doing, but in that very limitation is the possibility of walking the tightrope and doing something that's magnificent, right? And so the limit is creative. The limit is what creates the story and what's the makes the possibility of that intimacy or that engagement. Um, and then that all then shows how the limit is what creates the magnificent. And that limit is precisely what you embrace, which requires courage of you that has you walking the tightrope over the void, which then is dancing like that star. And it's precisely because at any moment someone could question the mo mo motives of everyone and crash it on in. When that does not occur, there's something that's magnificent about it, just like that tightrope walker. So those are thoughts that came to mind. But I have enjoyed this a lot, dear friends. Thank you for your time. And may you have a wonderful day. Thank you all. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. You. All the best. Thank you, everyone. Tyler, Cheetah, Clayton, Philip, Javier, Michelle, everyone. It's been a treat. Thank you all.